Hello, welcome to Middle Eastern World Affairs class and we are in week two and today uh, we will discuss one of the most interesting but at the same time the neglected topics in Middle Eastern studies which is Orientalism and its critics. So, Orientalist approaches is so important, is very important because it's actually uh, you cannot separate Orientalist discourse from the Middle Eastern studies. Uh, because Orientalist approach is actually, it's all about the politics, it's not only uh, academic discussion. So when we look at the uh, Middle Eastern, the history of Middle East, we see that the, the first studies in the, uh, about the Middle East is all sponsored by the government, uh, European governments and particularly in England. So when the people want to learn about the Middle East, they try to make it through three uh, main concerns. So the first concern was uh, geography. So when we see that the first studies of the Middle East is focused on geography. So for example, where are mountains, where are rivers, uh, where are water reserves, you know, uh, where are deserts, you know, all this of uh, stuff. So first, in order to uh, control a region, you need to, of course, uh, know the geography. So secondly, uh, after the studies is developed on geography, the second concern become people. So how the Middle Eastern people look like? For example, what is their habits? What is their culture? What they eat? What they drink? What they like? What they hate? What are their emotions? what they look like, you know, all these things. So just focus on the people. So once the studies on the Middle East, these Orientalist uh, discourses, uh, have all this map about the geography and the people, the last remaining part of the triangle was, of course, politics, because late then afterwards, you know the people, you have all these studies about the geography and the people, the next focus was politics. So they try to implement, they try to exploit all this knowledge about the Middle East and they even use it for their own terms. And at the end of the day, because of the Orientalist discourse, which is still dominant in many European countries, uh, it becomes so easier to occupy and interfere to the Middle East. So when we look at the Orientalist approaches, they all argue peculiarity of the Middle East on state formation, culture, religious. So they treated all the Islamic countries as one, as same. And when I say the peculiarity, of course, it's all used in the negative manner, not in the positive manner, because all the Islamic countries are treated as one and they all defined with negative uh, characteristics. So like this, for example, they are all religious, they are all feudal, they are all anti-rational. So they cannot be successful because of their cultural features. And Weber, a famous sociologist, he defined the Islam as a fixed religion which makes Muslim societies reluctant to accept change. So here, mainly the Arabs' culture and because of the Islam, they defined all these uh, characteristics, they define all these negative characteristics and they claim that with these cultures, with this culture, Arabs cannot be successful. So, as I said, all the studies that define the people paved the way for European involvement and colonialism in the Middle East. So, for example, Lesser, uh, Kuhn, Gurnebaum, these are the famous Orientalists, they defined the Arab mind as root proud, ambitious, to be leader, and they have many extremes, like emotions, fantasies, they, they are very cut from the reality. So you see that there's all this uh, negativeness associated with the Arab people. Gurnebaum is also say that Arabs is so spoiled and they are exaggerated on their language, religion, culture, which led them to unrealistic conclusions and Arabs has a very uh, strong feeling that they are a chosen people, although they are very ordinary, 
but uh, they think themselves as very uh, elected uh, and chosen people. And here, uh, let me tell you an anecdote. For example, Kuhn is also defined. And on his writings, for example, uh, in one of his writings, he defined the Arabs as brutal people who tortured the animals and put the animal blood to their forehead and, you know, dancing and separating this. So if you don't know the Islamic culture and, and if you don't know that this is a, a typical um, a kurban uh, activity that is uh, done as a religious duty, the, the Islam's, uh, the, the Muslim people do it, you may think that indeed, the, you know, the uh, Muslim people are so brutal and they are killing the sheep and whatever and, you know, they are putting the blood to their forehead. So, as you said that, it's all try to exploit uh, and pave the way for European involvement to the Middle East. So, when we sum up, we see that Orientalist mind is defined as traditional, religious, Muslim mind, and of course it's very irrational, versus developed, democratic, uh, pragmatic, Western mind. So the Islam is always defined as primitive and pre-scientific, pre and Orientalist approaches argue that the gap between the others and the West is practically unbridgeable. So as Kun mentioned, there is no way that Arabs can comprehend the, how the West achieved its success and modernity. So this gap is unbridgeable, according to Kun, and this Orientalist approach is so strong, and if you carefully read, even if the modern sources, even if the contemporary sources about the Middle East, you see that this connection and this understanding is still standing at the very core of the approaches. So, we can say that this timeless essentialism remained in Islamic, uh, on, on approach to Islamic societies, and because of this reason, Islam and Islamic countries always associated with negativeness, like terror, violence, etc., etc. So, of course, when this Orientalist discourse is made, we see that Edward Said and his, uh, you know, the uh, perfect contribution, which shakes all this Orientalist discourse from the roots, which is called Orientalism and its critics, Said give us a new perspective about the purpose of this analysis uh, regarding the Middle East. So, as Gerges argued, we see that Middle Eastern studies practice in the West is all based on Orientalism. So Said like drove these links, and Orientalism is providing us a perfect way of understanding Western style for dominating, restructuring, and having authority over the Orient. So, without knowing an Orientalism, we cannot understand what's really going on in the Arab Middle East. So, Orientalism is like a guidebook, a perfect guidebook, who is telling us how we should read the Middle East. So, uh, we see that one other contribution of sight is that the Orient is all related with the colonial mind and interests of the great powers, so especially Britain, France, and United States. United States in the contemporary times, especially in the post-Second uh, World War era, become the main source of Orientalist discourse. Beforehand, it was British and France who are, who are sponsoring and benefiting from Orientalist discourse. But nowadays, since the shift of power moved to USA, we see that it is the United States who are benefiting most from uh, this Oriental discourse. And Said, Edward Said, give us a very perfect point. He said that the external powers' interest in the region is both political and cultural at the same time. So, as I mentioned, the significance of Said's uh, unique masterpiece is telling us how we should study to the Middle East, and he perfectly drove the links between relationship between the power and knowledge, and Said let us to think about these questions. Is there any possibility for non-political scholarship? Is it really possible? Because for the Said, unfortunately, it's not. 
is it really advisable to have two close relationship between the scholar and the state and what is the role of the intellectual so here we see that when you study the Middle East especially if you are doing it in a Western state and if you have a let's say orientalist mind or inspired uh, intellectual he or she will drive you to focus on the subject that is let's say criticize the Middle East and somehow directly or indirectly contribute to the orientalist discourse of course this is not done very openly but at the end of the day when we look at the outputs come from the Middle Eastern studies in terms of scholar work uh, books articles we see that still maybe almost all of them maybe 99 percent of them is still uh, providing a base for orientalist discourse and by this way we see that uh, the others or let's say the, uh, the alternative views have been marginalized have been discredited and cannot be presented in the academia even still today so the scholarship does it should have an autonomy from the politics yes of course but the question is is it possible nowadays to have an pure academic world work without an sponsorship without a backup from the think tanks or other organizations so that's a very remarkable question and problem remaining at the very heart of the middle Eastern studies so Rex Brynan is also uh, when you talk about this uh, relationship he said that English language is now dominating Middle Eastern studies and most of the studies is just supporting the US activities and US strategic interest so there's a reason that why Middle Eastern studies and Middle Eastern main think tanks and uh, journals about the Middle Eastern studies is US based at the moment because of the only nowadays the US is paying the most concern and most sponsorship to these studies so Brian is also talk about that US foreign policy formulation and support the strategic interest in the region and he said that in order to break this we need to focus on problem identification and less construction of analytic theory so even this orientalist discourse is are defining what is the problem so instead of people is asking about or thinking about what's the problem is actually it's dictating on them you know even what is the problem so Brynan is making a uh, you know significant uh, quotation he said that um, the region consistent with the response of certain well-defined extra academic needs and powers he's identifying particularly the US here and he said that it's where we start to question the studies of the Middle East. Who is the sponsor? What is the interest of the sponsor? And how we can distinguish, let's say, this relationship between power and knowledge. So, we see that the academia is not separated, cannot be separated from Orient, from the power, from the politics so there's this triangle where we see state knowledge and big powers interest so the main problem is <coughs> middle east is represented rather than being represent itself that's a very important question because the middle east and middle eastern people in most of the case cannot be allowed to define themselves that's a huge problem and it's all defined it's all categorized by the outsiders and here as also mentioned like traditional orientalist and also Said argue it becomes so easier for the European covers to implement their policy and to guide and dominate the Middle East so Middle East is a way of thinking is constructed and occupied by the outsider powers and as a result it emerged as weak irrational and mainly cowardly actually and where we see that the external powers with all these justifications they can interfere to the Middle East more easily 
So how we can conclude, how we can make the conclusion? First of all, we should be aware that there's a this close connection between academia, between state politics, between sponsorship. Because none of the think tanks, none of the states will sponsor an academic study that will fulfill its interest. So, first of all, we should be very well aware of this and we shouldn't be think that, let's say, all these uh, journals and think tanks are providing academic or objective reports or uh, contributions. Indeed, actually, they are all telling us a one-sided policy and, first of all, we should be very aware of this on our study on the Middle East. So, by this way, we can see really understand what is cooked in the kitchen because most of the times uh, policymakers make a decision and then they try to impose it to the people and in this respect academia, think tanks, all these uh, channels make it easier for the people to let's say uh, exploit it and uh, changing the truth and telling us only one side of the story. So. The idea is more or less is the same. The Middle Eastern people are brutal. Its democracy is against the Muslim minds. They are dangerous. They are incapable. So if you make everything like this, then naturally people would come with the conclusion that Middle Eastern people and Middle Eastern countries need a model. They need a guidance. They need help. They need, you know, all kind of assistance from the external powers to, you know, uh, to survive, to continue their activities. So this all show us the strength of Orientalist discourse. So thank you for listening. We'll continue with other topics in the coming lectures. Thank you.